guys, I'm homesick. I really wish we could go back to the ocean. Dude, we were never in the ocean. We've always lived here. Well, let's go check out some of our cousins anyways. Mateys, what's a pirate's favorite letter? You might think it's R, but me first love is the C. Mm. Hoist those sails, mateys, let's go. Water covers 70% of the Earth's surface, and all of this water is divided into smaller regions like oceans and seas. So what's the difference between an ocean and a sea? Ocean and seas have three major differences, and they are how big they are, how deep they are, and the animals they attract to live there. First, let's take a look at their size. The world has five large oceans and seas are subparts of oceans that are surrounded by land. Let's take a look at a world map so that we can get a better visual of the size of an ocean and a sea. The five oceans are the Arctic Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Southern Antarctic Ocean, and the biggest of them all, the Pacific Ocean. There are only seven seas listed on this map but there are over 50 seas in the world and the Bering Sea between Alaska and Russia is the largest. The next difference between an ocean and sea is that an ocean is deeper. The deepest part of any sea is in the Caribbean and it's just 23,000 feet deep, but the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean is 36,000 feet deep. Last, although oceans take the prize in area and depth, seas attract the most marine life. Seas have more animals because they are shallow and that makes it easier for sunlight to penetrate the surface. Sunlight creates photosynthesis and photosynthesis helps plants live and grow. It's time for Shakespeare Says. I to the world am like a drop of water that in the ocean seeks another drop. This has been Shakespeare Says. Welcome to the open ocean, little fish. We'll be taking a tour down the water column of the pelagic zones. The word pelagic comes from the Greek word pelagos, which translates to the open ocean. Each zone is like a different neighborhood in the open sea, all stacked on top of one another, from the surface waters to the depths of the trenches seven miles below. Scientists have divided up the ocean into five zones, and currently they estimate that we've only explored five to 10% of it. The depth measurements of each zone are rough estimates. What really differentiates each zone is the level of light and heat. We'll start at the surface and dive down to explore the wild, wonderful world beneath the waves. This is the epipelagic zone. This section of the ocean goes from the surface down to about 200 meters deep, give or take a few meters. It's also known as the photic zone or the sunlight zone. This part of the ocean is the warmest because it receives the most amount of sunlight. The sun and wind help to mix the surface layer around and the temperature changes the most as the seasons turn from hot to cold during the year. It can range from 97 degrees Fahrenheit to negative two degrees Fahrenheit depending on how close you are to the tropics and the time of year. In the epipelagic zone, sunlight reaches the organisms who live here. That means that plants can grow. These smaller photosynthetic creatures who live on sunlight and water for food, algae, plankton, and seaweed, support a much larger web of life in this zone. You'll find dolphins, tuna, mackerel, man o' war, jellyfish, sea turtles, blue whales, and most of the sharks all live here. The surface waters are active and full of different species depending on the time of day or night. Sometimes, fish will stay in the next level down during the day, but come back up when it's dark to feed on the plankton and other small surface photosynthetic creatures. Welcome to the mesopelagic zone. This section of the ocean starts at 200 meters and extends down to about a thousand meters deep. This section is known as the twilight zone. Doo -doo 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 -doo. 
The mesopelagic zone gets very little light and heat from the sun, only 1%. But the little that does get through, combined with the mixing of the surface waters and the deep cold waters from Davy Jones Locker, means this section gets colder and colder as we descend. It generally ranges from 55 all the way down to 39 degrees Fahrenheit near the transition to the bathopelagic zone. This temperature drop is known as the thermocline. Only animals can live here since there's not enough sunlight to sustain plants. The kinds of animals you might encounter here usually have really big eyes that point upward so they can detect prey above them in the shadowy murk of the mesopelagic zone. You'll also see flashes of animals who make their own light. 90% of creatures who live here make their own light as a lure for prey, to communicate with others, or to find mates. This is known as bioluminescence, or light, that comes from living creatures. A really famous example of this is the anglerfish with a sparkly lure on its head. Pretty creepy looking, yeah? Several species of angler live between the mesopelagic and bathoplegic zones below. Sperm whales, octopi, hatchet fish, all of these spend most of their time here as well. This zone of the ocean is also the daytime home for some of the surface water fish. They come down here to hide during the day, then rise to feed on the plankton and other creatures at night. Sometimes their predators rise with them. Let's dive a little deeper. Now we've entered the bathypelagic zone, also known as the midnight or aphotic zone. This zone is so deep and dark, it basically only has one temperature. It stays right around a bone chilling 39 degrees Fahrenheit or 4 degrees Celsius. The water column above this zone is so tall that no light at all can reach this level of the sea. This zone extends from about 1,000 meters to 4,000 meters in some places, depending on this consistent temperature. There are plenty of strange creatures you might encounter, such as the rat tail fish or the gulper eel. You also might run into the fang fish or the velvet whale fish. The dark, cold water might make you think that this means no animals that can breathe air come down here. But the largest toothed whale, the sperm whale, hunts all the way down to 3,280 meters for food. Their favorite food is the giant squid, which can reach up to 59 meters and weigh almost a ton. Some of the other animals it eats are sharks, skatefish like manta rays, and other fish. Sperm whales eat one to two tons of food every single day. No light reaches this realm of the sea, so the only lights are bioluminescent ones like this one, generated by creatures such as the dragonfish. Be careful if you see glowing lights in the ocean. They're probably attached to creatures with some pretty large teeth. Ready to go even deeper? Let's dive. Enter the abyss, or the abyssopelagic zone. This is the bottom of the water column, Davy Jones Locker for most of the world's oceans. The name comes from the Greek word abyss, which means bottomless, because until very recently, people couldn't come down here at all. The abyssopelagic zone lies between 3,000 and 6,000 meters below the surface in eternal darkness, with a regular temperature of 36 to 37 degrees Fahrenheit, or two to three degrees Celsius. This is the deepest part of the sea for anywhere that doesn't have trenches on the ocean floor. And combined with the bathypelagic or midnight zone, that's more than 80% of the total ocean. Down here, we have all kinds of weird creatures like the chemosynthetic polychaete worms, the glass sea sponge, the black swallower fish, and the tripod fish. Very, very little of what happens at the surface makes its way down here. Very, very little of what happens at the surface makes it down here, so for many years, scientists believed that not very much life existed down here at all. They believed that all life comes from the sun. Then, organisms who live on hydrothermal vents or underwater volcanoes were discovered. They get energy from a process called chemosynthesis, which is like photosynthesis, but they get nutrients from the chemicals produced by the vents and volcanoes. This discovery rocked the scientific world. The abyssopelagic zone is one of the most mysterious zones in the ocean, and humans still have so much to discover. Only one zone lies deeper. Are you ready for the deepest part of the ocean? Let's dive. Welcome to the Hadal, little fish. The hadopelagic zone is one of the most unexplored places on Earth. More people have been to the moon than have explored these depths. 
One of the most famous bits of real estate down here is known as the Mariana Trench, and it goes down to almost 11,000 meters. At this level, it's tough to live unless you're specially adapted to enormous water pressure and darkness. Some neighbors you might have down here are snailfish, sea cucumbers, and some varieties of giant squid. That reaches the very end of our special tour today. Over to you, Ian. Ahoy, and welcome to the USS Panther Lab. Today, we're gonna to be taking a deep dive under the ocean, but I can't just jump in the water and swim to the bottom. Why not? Well, because as you dive deeper into the ocean, the pressure becomes stronger and stronger. Right now, as I'm standing on the deck of the ship, I'm experiencing one atmosphere of pressure. That means the pressure pushing in on my body is equal to the pressure pushing out from my body. I'm going to get in my submarine and dive to 68 feet below the surface. I'll meet you there. Here we are at 68 feet and here comes my diving buddy. At this depth, the pressure pushing in on him is about 30 pounds per square inch or PSI. That's roughly two atmospheres of pressure. Let's go deeper. Here we are at 102 feet. At this depth, the pressure pushing in on our diver is about 45 PSI or roughly three atmospheres of pressure. The deeper you go, any air-filled spaces in our bodies become compressed. Let's keep going. We are now at 136 feet deep. At this depth, the pressure on our diver is about 60 PSI or four atmospheres of pressure. Now let's really deep dive. Here we are at 1,090 feet. An Egyptian man set the Guinness World Record by diving to this depth in only scuba gear. At this depth, the pressure is about 483 PSI or almost 33 atmospheres of pressure. I'm glad I'm in this submarine and not out there. So far, humans have not been able to get any deeper unless they use a submersible. Okay, time to head back up to the surface, but we can't go too fast. If a diver ascends too quickly, the nitrogen in their body can start to form bubbles in their blood, tissue, and joints. This causes decompression sickness, or what some people call the bends. This is similar to the fizz of carbon dioxide coming out of your soda when you open it. We have to wear protective gear and use specialized cabins to explore the deep ocean because the pressure and oxygen levels are different from the surface of the Earth. Can you think of another place like that? Oceans, huh? Well, I'm a chicken farmer, and I just found out that sharks can lay eggs. What else can you do? We could see in the dark, doo -doo 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 -doo. That's because of a reflective layer in our eyes called the tapetum. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And we also can be light. Doo -doo 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 -doo. That's because our bones are cartilaginous. We don't have regular bones, it's squishy. And we live long, do, 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 do. Well, not me personally, but my species. Did you know sharks can be found from 455 million years ago? Wow! Do, 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 do. Yay! Aw, y'all fellas are cute. Goodbye, chickens. <laughs> and hello, sharks. Come on down to Shark King, and you can pet some baby sharks. Ah, these aren't babies. Remember, your safety's not guaranteed. I'm getting out of here. Ah! Hello, everyone. I am Anita Fishbowl, and this is your special news bulletin. I caught up with everyone's favorite shark, Baby Shark, earlier today, and what he had to say may shock you. Take a look. I'm sick of everyone calling me Baby. Call me Disco Shark. You heard it here first, folks. Did you know that some sharks lay eggs, but others don't? <coughs> However, the egg that a shark lays looks very different than a chicken egg or any other animal that lays eggs. That's because these eggs need to attach to something so they don't float away. Hello, mammals. How long do you think you can hold your breath? Timer on the screen. Ready, set, go. <sighs> I held my breath for about 10 seconds. How long did you hold yours? 
Did you know that an orca can hold its breath for 15 minutes, a narwhal can hold its breath for 25 minutes, and that a blue whale can hold its breath for 90 minutes? But wait a minute, if we're both mammals that need air to breathe, why is it that mammals can hold their breath much longer than we can? Before we answer that question, let's learn more about these marine mammals. A mammal is any animal that has hair, can feed its babies milk, and gives birth to live babies or basically doesn't lay eggs. Let's start this discussion with the biggest toothless mammal in the world, the blue whale. Blue whale babies are born weighing 9,000 pounds and can grow to 300,000 pounds. They migrate to different oceans to find food, but I think the coolest thing about the blue whale is that they are super loud. When blue whales communicate, their songs can be heard up to 500 miles away. Now let's talk about dolphins. Not that dolphin, but this dolphin, the orca. Orcas are also known as killer whales, but they're called killer whales because of their intelligent hunting techniques. When orcas spot a seal or a penguin floating on a piece of ice, they create waves to rock the ice back and forth, knocking the animal back into the water. This is the same sort of thing that happens when you're sitting on a floaty in a pool and the waves come on. If you don't hold on tight, you'll fall right back into the water. And last, let's discuss the unicorn of the sea, the narwhal. A narwhal is called a unicorn for obvious reasons, but the horn on its head is not really a horn at all. It's more like a tooth or its tusk. This is the same type of tusk that you would see on an elephant or a walrus, but they have just one. This tooth actually starts off small like ours, but will eventually grow up to nine feet long. It's not clear why they have them, but regularly only male narwhals grow these tusks and it's believed that they use them to fight, taste the saltiness of the water to find things to eat, and to impress the ladies. Now let's get back to our question. Why is it that marine mammals can hold their breath for a really long time? When we breathe in oxygen, our body creates carbon dioxide that we have to exhale. And the longer we hold our breath, the carbon dioxide turns acidic and our brain begins to tell us to breathe. Marine mammals, however, have more hemoglobin and myoglobin, and this helps their blood store the oxygen much, much longer, allowing them to hold their breath for long periods of time. So in the end, if a blue whale, orca, or a narwhal challenges you to a breath hold competition, don't do it because you're going to lose. The ocean is a place full of adventure and wonder, so of course lots of people have written books that take place there. Our library's collection development librarian, Karen Jensen, told me about a few that I'd like to share with you. You can find each of these online through Overdrive or check them out through the library's curbside service. I'll start with a nonfiction book since that's my favorite. So I hope you'll like this one from Jess Keating. It's called Shark Lady, the true story of how Eugenie Clark became the ocean's most fearless scientist. It's about a young girl who turned her passion for sharks into her career exploring sharks in the ocean. There are two magic school bus stories that I wanna tell you about next. Sink or Swim is an early chapter book it's great for anyone who's still boosting their reading confidence and stamina because it has fast paced plots and illustrations on every page. In Sink or Swim, the kids try to save an endangered fish from a giant shark. And you can also try the Magic School Bus Rides Again Deep Sea Dive, where the kids go below the sea to find a missing locket and wonder at all the marvels the ocean has below the surface. Summer of the Sea Serpent is part of the Magic Treehouse series by Mary Pope Osborne. In this part of the popular fantasy series, 
readers go on a fantastic ocean adventure that will bring 20,000 leagues under the sea to mind. And in Songs for a Whale by Lynn Kelly, a deaf girl helps a whale who can't sing find a way to connect with his pod, and together the two of them make a beautiful whale song. I hope you'll check out these books that will take you and your imagination under the sea. Thank you for joining us today. Here we are on our live coverage with 817 Library News. Here to answer the question, what did the ocean say to the shore? Excuse me, what did the ocean say to the shore? I don't know, I'm a chicken! <coughs> Excuse me, what did the ocean say to the shore? Can you definitively answer, what did the ocean say to the shore? Wow, we did a lot of research, and the ocean didn't say anything. It just waved. Well, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. The ocean didn't say anything to the shore. All it did was wave. What do you hear when you hold a seashell up to your ear? Is it a magical link to the ocean? It may seem like it. Some people have guessed that what you hear is blood rushing through your ears, but the sound doesn't change after you've done a few jumping jacks. Others have hypothesized that the sound is air rushing through the shell, but if you try it in a soundproof room that has air, you actually don't hear anything. So scientists think that what is really going on is that the shell is capturing noise from around the room and becoming a resonating chamber. This is also a resonating chamber. Sound waves enter into the chamber, bounce around, and come out louder. You can make a similar resonating chamber with a cup or sometimes even your hand. The size and shape of your resonating chamber influences the sound you hear, and if you move it around with different angles and distances from your ear, you can get different sounds. Try finding some other resonating chambers and comparing them to the sound of a shell or a cup. Hi friends, if you're ever on the beach, then you're more than likely to encounter a seashell. But what's a seashell? Mollusks, like snails, oysters, and clams, produce calcium carbonate, and this calcium carbonate hardens to make seashells to act like a skeleton on the outside for their soft bodies. Seashells are cool to observe, but when you're done, leave them on the beach. The ecosystem will thank you. We're flying! No, that's not the ocean behind us. It's a garbage dump. But did you know that waste management workers and city municipalities take a huge role in keeping oceans safe? As you can see, the workers are sorting all the materials using their big heavy duty machinery. But what can you do to help them? Yeah, let's go check, check it out. See, these people, they're not doing it right. They took the trash and they're bagging it up, but it's not put away. All the trash that's spilling out of this bag can end up in rivers, waters, and back in the ocean. What happens when waters get polluted? Well, let's check it out. Ready? You see this bottle? It's flowing down the water stream, and eventually all water goes back to the ocean. And what do you think are in oceans? Yeah, animals. Imagine if you were an animal in the water and you were seeing a bunch of plastic in your home. Wait, we don't have to imagine. I have magic. Ready? Here we are under the ocean. As you can see, Mr. Turtle swimming in his natural habitat. Oh no, there's trash. Well, I can do something to fix it. I'm gonna swim on over. Oh, I got the trash. Well, it's hard if you're a kid and you don't live near the ocean to collect trash. But what you can do at home is to reduce your use of single-use plastics. That's like plastic cups, plates, or straws. Another thing that you can do is to consider recycling your plastic and your trash after you finish. It's best if you do that, and then it'll go in the dump instead of in the ocean. Can you help Mr. Turtle? I sure hope you can. This is a mantis. This is a shrimp. This is a mantis shrimp, which is neither, but looks like both. 
Mantis shrimp are stomatopods, their own order of marine crustaceans. Most species live in tropical and subtropical waters, and there is at least one species in the Gulf of Mexico that is known as a thumb splitter for the damage it can do to humans. Mantis shrimp have the fastest punch in the world, as fast as a speeding bullet. Even if they miss their prey, the shockwave that their punch creates can be enough to stun their victim. They aren't often kept in aquariums because they have been known to break aquarium glass and they are voracious predators. Voracious here means they eat everything they see. There are several species of mantis shrimp, but I think the most spectacular looking is the peacock mantis shrimp. Don't want to come too close to one of these, but they sure are cool. Ah, the ocean. The ocean has great flavors, from fish to crabs to seaweed. Have you ever tried any seaweed? If you've ever had sushi, then I'm betting that you've had some seaweed. Seaweed is what we use to wrap sushi. And I'm going to show you how to use this seaweed and use some salt some sugar, and some black sesame seeds to create yummy, yummy Japanese-style popcorn. So you can just use regular popcorn that you pop from a bag or plain popcorn kernels, unseasoned. And what we're going to do is we're going to take one tablespoon of black sesame seeds and we're going to put it in the pestle. And we're going to grind it up with one tablespoon of brown sugar, a teaspoon of salt, and however much seaweed you want to add. I'm gonna grab a handful, and the best way to cut up seaweed is to use some scissors. I have these different style scissors that will cut it into shreds. It's really useful for cutting up herbs, and I'm gonna cut up the seaweed. If you've ever had some instant noodles, this is a great way to add extra flavor to your noodles is by adding some seaweed. Here we go. So here is the seaweed flakes. As you can see, it's very fine. I'm going to also grab some seaweed. You can eat it just plain. I like to eat it like this, like they're chips. So I have black sesame seeds and I'm going to put it into my mortar and pestle. Put it in. I have my brown sugar. We're gonna put that in. And my salt. Put that in. Once we have that, we're going to grind it all up and create a great seasoning for our popcorn. Let's go ahead and mash it up. Mash, mash, mash. Mm -hmm. Once we have that all incorporated, we're gonna put in our seaweed. Let's go ahead and sprinkle our seaweed into our mixture. We're gonna put it in the mortar and pestle and we're gonna keep on grinding. Yummy, yummy. And finally, what we're going to do is take our popcorn and we're going to sprinkle this mixture on top. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Mix it in. And there you have it. Seasoned popcorn, Japanese style, with some yummy seaweed. What does the word marine mean and where does it come from? Marine means of, found in, or produced by the sea. Its origin comes from the Latin word marinus, which means to belong to the sea. What are some of the cool jobs you can do if you like working in, on, or around the ocean? Marine biologists study marine life and organisms in the sea. Marine chemists study the chemical properties of different bodies of water with the goal of making them safer and cleaner. Marine geologists study the rocks and seafloor of the ocean. Coral ecology oceanographer study coral reefs and its ecosystem. Fishermen catch fish, crabs, lobsters, and other sea life to feed us. Ship captains drive boats from small fishing vessels to huge cruise ships. Underwater welder make repairs to important structures under the water. You could also work in an aquarium if you want to help educate others the importance of all marine life, both in the ocean and in freshwater too. Aquatic veterinarian helps take care of underwater creatures. 
Scuba diving instructors help teach people how to scuba dive. Underwater filmmakers help to make movies, TV shows, and other outlets for film and video. We have to wear protective gear and use specialized cabins to explore the deep ocean because the pressure and oxygen levels are different from the surface of the Earth. Can you think of another place like that? Did you say space? If so, you're right! Just like ocean explorers use scuba gear and deep sea submarines to provide oxygen and pressurized environments under the deep sea, astronauts use spacesuits and spaceships to do those things in space. Space exploration borrows a lot from early sea exploration. In fact, all of NASA's space shuttles were named after famous exploring ships. Either out in space or under the sea, there's still lots to explore. Well, I hope you had fun taking a dive under the sea and learning something new about this marine world. If you'd like to learn more about everything marine, make sure to check out the online resources from the Fort Worth Public Library by visiting fortworthlibrary.org. However, if you like to read fiction books, we have those too, like The Line Tender, or The Vicious Deep, or A Song Below Water. You can also check out the free resources from NOAA's website by visiting www.oceanservice.noaa.gov kids. And NASA also offers free information for kids about the ocean. Check them out by visiting www.climatekids.nasa.gov ocean. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.